Welcome to Screen Time with today's Communique. So excited to have Ms. Kamara Seals joining us to talk about a very um, important and serious topic. September is Suicide Awareness and Prevention Month. And we know that one suicide is too many. Uh, we also know that it is something that is not really covered a lot in communities of color, specifically in the African American community. And we're going to touch on that today. Um, we're also going to talk about how suicide has impacted Ms. Seals' family, and then just some general conversation about suicide. So thank you, Ms. Seals, for joining us today. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for having me. It is. Uh... A pleasure uh, to be back with you, uh, just kind of bittersweet uh, to be with you on this topic, but I do appreciate being here. Yes, ma'am. Before we get started and jump into the conversation, for those who may not know you, tell us a little bit about yourself. Okay, okay, great. Well, my name is Kamara Seals, and I was uh, born and raised in a small town in South Arkansas, Southeast Arkansas called Hamburg. And uh, that is my home. I still have family in Hamburg. And uh, I moved Pine Bluff to go to UAPB. I am a, a proud graduate, uh, 1994 alum of the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff. And I am currently the uh, national alumni president. And so I love serving and giving back to my alma mater. Uh, I am a mother of three kids. I have uh, a, just a precious, sweet grandson, Carter, who's six. Uh, and as you can probably tell from the smile, he is the, uh, uh, the apple of my eye. <laughs> and, uh, but I am in um, policy. Uh, my career took two paths, policy and politics. And so I am currently the policy director at the Arkansas Public Policy Panel. Uh, I also have a political consulting company, SDR Consulting Group, that was established in May of 2000. So I've had that company for 21 years, but I've actually been in politics for oh, a little over 30 years. Um, more of my adult life has been spent working in Little Rock as opposed to Pine Bluff. So, yes, you and we're we're both proud members of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. <laughs> Absolutely, <laughs> don't want to forget that important point. That's right. That's right. A shout out to my sorors. Yes, and uh, I'm active, also active with the Pine Bluff branch in AACP, uh, as well as some other. Um, uh, grassroots organizations here in uh, Pine Bluff. So thank you for telling us a little bit about you. And so just to kind of jump into our conversation and the topic for the evening, we're talking about suicide. And so right. um, you lost your son to mm -hmm. suicide. And um, would you tell us just a little bit about DeAndre? Tell us about him. Absolutely. De DeAndre was, uh, he was such a good kid. He was uh, very compassionate. He was uh, a gentle giant. He played football, loved football. Uh, he started uh, peewee football with the uh, Eastside Panthers uh, when he was, I don't know, probably six. I don't know what, what, I don't know what age they start, but he was a little boy, him and his brother and uh, played all the way through college. And uh, he was, like I said, he was just, he had a laugh that was just contagious. He would laugh uh, just from the pit of his stomach if there was something funny. And uh, he was a good student. He was, uh, his favorite subject was history. He loved history and he enjoyed politics, you know, but he grew up in the in a family that was very political and he got to, uh, my children got to go to a lot of political events with me. So he just, uh, he and he, he had such pride in being a zebra. Uh, he was co-captain of the football team his senior year of high school. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that was very special for him. And uh, I believe he was the second strongest, you know, they used to have these competitions in the weight room uh, at the football field, I mean, at the uh, field house. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. And uh, I believe he was the second strongest. So he used to take pride in all of that. So, and he loved his family. After he passed away, uh, some much time later, I was looking at his Facebook post okay. and he posted a lot about family and how he loved his family. His family had his back. Uh, he posted a lot about his faith and about God. And I was just like, oh, wow. You know, and those were things I hadn't seen while he was alive, you know. So he was, you know, he didn't give me any trouble. Uh, the only trouble that I remember him getting in at school was when he'd have that cell phone. <laughs> you know, that was the age those kids were getting cell phones and right. they want to have phones. And uh, But yeah, he was just and a very kind-hearted well-mannered uh, young man and he was 19 uh, when he passed away so he okay. did get to play one year of college football okay. at um, this and I can't think the college it was college in Kansas okay. and uh, he made special teams as a freshman and so we got to go see him play uh, several times so uh, just a good kid we miss him so so much I can't e words can't even express how much we miss him uh, his birthday would have been last week okay and, uh, he would have been 27 wow 27. Mm -hmm. so can you talk a little bit about um you know he passed away at age 19 uh -huh. how has that been um uh, for you as a mom, and then more broadly, as a family working through um, his passing? Yeah, it, it is, it has been difficult. It is, it has been difficult. Uh, I still grieve. We still grieve. It's just a different type of grief. Right. Uh, he, like I said, he has been transitioned seven years. Mm -hmm. um, and you learn to, uh, like I say, it's a different grief now than it was then. But uh, you continue to miss him. Uh, and I often wonder what he would be doing, where he'd be in life. Uh, and I keep up with his classmates, and that's really helpful. Okay. He had some amazing friends and classmates, and they'll reach out, Miss Seals or Mama Seals, just checking on you. Uh, they'll text me or inbox me on Facebook. So that helps. But uh, I do want to share the fact that DeAndre had a mental illness. Okay. And he was, di he was diagnosed uh, at the age of 19. Okay. Uh, but we didn't see uh, what happened with him during high school, growing up or during high school, we didn't see uh, any patterns okay. uh, of mental illness. So this happened uh, and, and uh, psychologists and, and mental health professionals uh, have explained it to us, uh, but he had what was called a psychotic break. Okay. Uh huh. And so, th and there were a number of factors, things that were happening mm -hmm. uh, that could have caused that. Um, uh, and one of the things that you know, when we think back, his dad and I were going through a divorce mm -hmm. his junior year okay. of high school, and. Uh, and then we lost uh, what I call a bonus son. Uh, we lost a bonus son, which he was like a brother to him. Right, yeah. uh, he drowned. And, um, and so I think that was a lot with uh, j just for, you know, a, a, a child to have to, to carry, you know. And then he went away to college and he went so far, but that's where he wanted to go. I mean, he wanted to go to this school in Kansas uh, there was a school, two schools in Arkansas he was hoping to go to, but he did not get a football scholarship okay. uh, to either of those schools. And one of the schools had been looking at him. He'd been doing uh, football combines and camps and things like that. <clears throat> and so, but it, neither of those worked out. And so uh, he, he says, you know, I really want to leave the state. And so it worked out. Uh, with Bethany College, that's the name of it. And so uh, he was so far from home, but he did really well in school. And, uh, but even, even with that, it was just so far away. It wasn't like we could see him every other weekend, right. you know. Right. And um, 
you know, he had an incident there that we didn't find out about until after his death, they told us about it. And it was a racial incident. Oh. And the school he went to uh, was 90% white, white mm -hmm. students. And so the students of color or uh, black students that were there mm -hmm. either played football, basketball, soccer, or some sport, you know. And so there, there had been some situations uh, with that. And so, but I didn't know about it because he really did like the school. So we think there were a number of things that led to that, but we did, after he came home, after his freshman year, it's when we started noticing okay. that something was wrong with him. And um, I'm going to be honest, I thought he was on drugs. And I asked him, because we have, you know, with my kids growing up, we were, I'd always say, hey, we have an open relationship, meaning right. you can talk to me. You know, I'm not going to fly off the handle. Right. Uh, I'll be a parent. I'm going to listen. I will hear you. So that's the kind of mom I was. You know, I wasn't friends with my kids, right. but I was a mother that would listen and could be open and, and hear what they had to say. I wanted to hear, hear them. And so uh, I asked him and he says, no, mom, I'm not, I'm, I'm not on drugs. I don't do drugs, you know, but all the signs I thought, because I didn't know, I didn't know the signs of depression. I didn't know the signs of mental illness. I didn't, I missed all of that. And so- as a mom, um, you knew something was different. Exactly. As a mom, I knew something was different. His brother and sister knew something was okay. different. Okay. His aunt and cousins, we all knew something was different, you know. Uh, Can you tell uh, me you, a little bit about that? Um, you said mm -hmm. you came home, you knew to, you knew something was different. You thought it was drugs, but it wasn't that. Was it like a behavior change? Was it appearance changes that, you know, made you think that something's not right here? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah, I will. Uh, yes, it was, it was behavior changes. And one of the first the first behavior change is that he didn't want to play football anymore. Well, he lived for football, but he now wanted to play basketball. He didn't want to go back to college. And so he said he wanted to transfer to UAPB and he did. We got him transferred. We got him in, uh, but he didn't want to play, you know. And so then he started uh, not going to class. Okay. Uh, he wouldn't eat dinner with us. Now we didn't it wasn't like at you know at one at certain point you know it's not like you just sit down and around the dinner table at the same time and eat you know <laughs> but he wouldn't he 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 wouldn't eat with us he 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 was more and more uh, what's the word he was um, distant okay. he became distant from us but then he had behaviors that were erratic mm. uh, he was he became at very easily agitated. That's and then right. there's sometimes it's like we it's almost like we don't know who he is something is wrong with him and I and I kept saying you know something is wrong with my child I just don't know what and so he like I said he would be aggressive he he found new friends that we didn't even know <laughs> you know he made new friends um and uh he started reading books that that were just like really really different Okay. And, uh, you know, he, we grew up in the church, uh, you know, our, we had our faith, our belief in God, and he just started having different types of thoughts, you know, and okay. questions. And, uh, and then he stopped, uh, you know, it's like his hygiene changed. And, you know, this is all over time, you know, right, right, it wasn't right. all at once. Yeah, it wasn't all at once, but so it was just patterns and, and I would wake him up in the morning for class and he would say, well, class is canceled. And I say, oh, okay. <laughs> well, I'd wake him up again. And he says, well, they, you know, and I thought, well, whoever these teachers are, aren't showing up, right. <laughs> you know, they're not doing their jobs, you know, well, lo and behold, he was staying up all night mm -hmm. and sleeping during the day. So his sleeping patterns were off. Uh, so it got to a point, he didn't want to go to college. He didn't want to go to school. He didn't want to work. Um, and so, uh, you know, I said, you know, we've got to get him tested. So, uh, you know, long story short, we did, we got him tested. 
his dad actually came from Texas and got him and got him into a facility because he was tested in Pine Bluff, uh, but that didn't yield, um, um, you know, he, he started going to therapy, but that didn't yield uh, many results. And so, but he, when he got to Texas, his dad got him tested uh, in a facility. So he was able, something happened and he was able to be inpatient for seven days. Gotcha. They did the diagnosis. They started a medication uh, regimen and uh, he was bi diagnosed as bipolar uh, with severe depression. Gotcha. And one other thing I can't remember. So that was his diagnosis. And when we found that out, we could see it because one minute he would be fine. The next minute he was someone we didn't have a clue who he was, you know. And so that those are the things that we started uh, noticing. Like I said, he was just uh, the isolation should have been a key because he's so family oriented. Mm -hmm. And when he started isolating himself, you know, I should have known, but I just didn't know all the signs at the time. And so knowing what you know now, mm -hmm. um, what um, advice, words of wisdom would you give to other parents who are seeing, you know, these red flags, something is different with their children? Um, what advice would you give to them on how to, you know, how to proceed? Right. I would, I would tell them to, uh, they know something is different try to get their child tested as soon as possible. Uh, and when I say tested, uh, a mental health treatment facility, I mean, it doesn't have to be an inpatient facility, but to get them seen by a therapist, they need to be evaluated. Mm -hmm. And see, DeAndre didn't get an evaluation for nine months after we saw this behavior. Okay. Uh, or maybe, or, or, or maybe six, I don't know, it was somewhere, between six and nine months, but I didn't know to get him evaluation. I didn't know. We just, you know, you go through it and, and, and I knew, I knew instantly when something was wrong with him. Uh, and I remember he would sit and, and, and it's like, he would look right through me almost like, like I wasn't there. Yeah. And it was just something about his eyes mm. that wasn't him. Right. Right. I didn't know who he was right. and it was, very, very hurtful mm -hmm. because I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what was wrong, you know, and I talked to him and we would talk, but even the conversation was different, you know? So, um, so yeah, I would say to parents, if you're, if, if your child is, is, if, if you see changes in behavior, mm -hmm. if they've been doing things that they love to do and they just stop doing those, they don't want to do them anymore. Uh, like I said, if they're ice isolating themselves if the their patterns their sleep and behavior you know if those patterns change dramatically my advice is to seek a uh evaluation through a mental health counselor that was my last option <laughs> you know i didn't know that should have been the first option and and, then, and and the sleeplessness that's another thing because he did not sleep a lot he was up literally all night okay. and he would sleep some, but it may have been three hours, three or four hours from like six in the morning to 10 or something like that. Yeah. So that, that was things that was happening with him. And so just to, to um, take that a step further, when you, when we were talking about, um, you know, talking with parents, um, realizing and seeing those signs um, and doing, you know, everything you can do um, to get help for your children, particularly in uh, communities of color in the Black right. community. When we're talking about mental health, um, a lot of times we, um, we're we hesitant or reluctant mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to address yeah. um, or, or say that it is something, that it's a mental health crisis or mental right. health issue. Um, and so how would you um, advise parents uh, once they discover or find out that their children are going through or, or have um, this diagnosis that's a mental health issue, how would you um, um, advise parents to, um, 
to, to deal with themselves mm-hmm. no, and yeah. acknowledging that their children are having a mental health crisis? The, the, I say they need to embrace it. They need to embrace the, their child. Mm-hmm. They need to accept it. And then they need to learn everything they can about the illness or the disease or whatever they've been diagnosed with. Mm-hmm. They've got to learn about it. And uh, one of the things I'm going to say that, that's so hurtful, mm-hmm. um, and, and a lot of times I blame myself, I just didn't know, mm-hmm. but this happened to my son four years, let me see, four years before I was diagnosed mm-hmm. with a mental illness mm-hmm. in 2010, let's put it that way. In 2010, I was diagnosed with a mental illness. And, um, but I was in denial. I was in denial because I could still function. I still work. I still took care of my children. Um, everything, you know, life continued, but I was hurting. I was struggling, but I did, I did get to a breaking point where things were breaking down. And that's when I went to get help Mm -hmm. and I got the diagnosis and, um, And so I, you know, of course I took my medication. I went to see my therapist and my psychiatrist. So I did those things. And so I had four years of this. And then when it happens to my son, I didn't recognize it. And so I feel like I failed him. I often, you know, I'm, I'm finally getting to a point where it's like, okay, this happened and I didn't know, but I should have known for the fact, simple fact that I had been diagnosed myself. Now I had a different diagnosis. I wasn't diagnosed with bipolar, right. uh, but I did have a mental health diagnosis. And so, uh, but, but also my symptoms were different than what he was dealing with, you know, what I had dealt with. So, uh, so, so my thing is for parents to immediately embrace your child Mm -hmm. um and to um you know don't be in denial and to educate yourself right Uh, you've got to educate yourself because we've got to know how to help our children or our our sister or brother whomever it is uh, our loved one we've got to know and it's I think it's important that we learn as much as we can about the illness and one of the things we're trying to do is rid the stigma. We're trying to, that's why we created the, this um, grassroots uh, organization in memory of my son. Uh, and it's called the DeAndre Seals Outreach Project. And we talk about mental health awareness and suicide prevention. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we want people to know that suicide is preventable. But we've got to talk about it. We've got to talk about what leads to suicide. You know, now my son had, uh, you know, he he had uh, a mental illness. Uh, and one of the things that he told me, I was with him the weekend before in Texas. My girlfriend and I uh, went to Texas to just hang out with him and see him. Uh, and this happened to be the weekend before he passed away. And, and when I got home, uh, we were talking that Monday and he kept telling me, Ma, I'm hearing these voices. They're talking to me, you know. And so I was trying to get to his doctors, right. but I just didn't make it in time, you. you know. So, yeah, I do. I want to I just want to encourage parents uh, to embrace your children. We embraced him. Right. Um, but I, I, I felt like we, I, I was a little slow to get the help that we needed. Um, and I'm glad that you mentioned that, um, when you started the, the foundation in his honor and his memory. So does the foundation, um, work with, um, outreach and advocacy, um, for those who are suffering, um, with mental illness? Does it work with outreach and advocacy for parents who are, um, you know, trying to embrace and wrap themselves around it and get educated, um, or, or is it, you know, none of those, or is it all yeah. above? Well, we, we, let me tell you, we are, a, we are, we do outreach and education. Gotcha. 
We don't provide a service. Support. We're, we're okay. not, yeah. We don't provide any services, but we provide resources. We're not eligible to provide services. Now we have two board members who are professionals gotcha. uh, in this area, uh, but but they they work at a facility. Gotcha. And so we do provide resources for parents and children where they can go. Uh, but as far as the work we do, we are we we talk about it. We have webinars. Of course, we're in this COVID environment, mm -hmm. so we haven't been able to do the in-person uh, workshops and things that we had originally planned. But we are doing uh, virtual seminars, and we've had some that have been just open webinars on Facebook. Then we do. Uh, those with just certain groups like sororities and fraternities. We've been doing those. Uh, we're going to be working with the Ivy Center for Education. Uh, we're gonna be doing another one for them coming up in October. So as groups reach out to us and as we reach out to groups, that's what we do. And so we talk about mental health, uh, you know, and, and the different forms of mental health, what it looks like and how you can get treatment, you know, um, and especially in this time of COVID, you know, one of our, one of our professionals talk about, you know, she sees her youngest patient that has a, a mental illness, depression, or anxiety is four years old, mm -hmm. you know, up to 80 years old. So, uh, and, and one thing about it, I want, I want people to hear me when I say a mental illness does not discriminate. Right. It doesn't matter your socioeconomic status. It doesn't matter your race or your nationality, your gender or how you identify. It doesn't matter your age. I was 40 years old when I was diagnosed, mm -hmm. 40. And so I thought I was just going through a phase and it would be over in a year <laughs> or six months, you know. Oh. And here we are 11 years later uh, and I still see you know, therapists, mm -hmm. uh, psychiatrists, and I take medication and do the things I need to do. I have a good support system. Um, and I'm, you know, really pleased about that. You know, I have a great support system. You know, I've learned coping mechanisms. I've learned about my illness and I share so that we can help other parents and right. other people. Uh, we're trying to rid the stigma. Right because there is the stigma that you talked about, especially in the African-American community. We don't want to say, well, you know, we don't want people to say we're crazy, you know, right, but right. one of the things we have, and crazy is not the right terminology, right. but one of the things we have to educate people on, is just like if you have, if you are diabetic, you go to the doctor and you get treated, you right. know, uh, if you have heart disease or if you have cancer, well, those are all issues, you know, maybe with organs or tissue. Those of us who suffer mental illness, we have an issue with the brain. Mm -hmm. It's an organ. Right, you know? right. And yeah. so, right, right. So, um, so yeah, that's just, that's what we do with the DeAndre Seals uh, Outreach Project. And it is mental health awareness and suicide prevention. And uh, we just, we, we educate people, we educate. And uh, people do call when they're in crisis and we provide a crisis assist, not assistance, but resources. You know, we have numbers where people can call. We have numbers where people can text uh, or where they can go and get treatment 24 hours a day. So that's, it's just that we ourselves uh, don't provide treatment. And, and so, Speaking of, um, you know, taking care of our mental health, mm -hmm. um, uh, and thank you for sharing your own personal uh, mm -hmm. journey. Um, and so when DeAndre um, uh, died by suicide, um, mm -hmm. I'm sure that has put you into another uh, realm of um, parenthood. Yes. And so what has his passing uh, taught you about yourself? Because I'm sure that 
you know, you went through a, a phase of, you know, like what's going on here, but what has mm. it taught you? You know, I know you'll never get to the, to the, to the other side of it because it is a, is it a, it's a journey, a daily it's journey. A journey. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what has it taught you about yourself? You know, uh, that's a good question. His death uh, has, has taught me that I'm actually stronger than I ever thought I, I could be. Mm -hmm. You ne No parent ever imagines, number one, bearing a child. Mm -hmm. That's not the chronological order of things. And then to bury a child who died by suicide is hard, right. okay? And so when that happened, I just didn't see how I would move forward. I didn't understand. I had so many questions and um, it was hurtful. Uh, I was in pain, mm -hmm. physical pain. You know, I mean, I literally hurt, um, but I still had two children that I had to be strong for, uh, who were there for me. And then six months to the day that DeAndre passed away, he passed away on June 17th of 2014. I had a grandson that was born December the 17th, oh, wow. uh, the same year, literally six months apart. And his mom and dad, named him Carter DeAndre mm. uh, in memory of my son DeAndre. So that was amazing. Yeah. So, but with his passing, I, I did learn that I was stronger uh, and more resilient because I just thought that was it. Mm -hmm. I just didn't see me doing much else right. uh, other than loving my two kids. Um, uh, but there were things that I know I needed to do um, in memory of him mm -hmm. so that other families perhaps didn't have to go through what I had went through. And I thought if I could educate other parents and the good thing about it, I've been able to do a lot of that one-on-one. -on -one. I've been able to be there for parents who call me and say, you know, my son, this, or my daughter, you know, and I'm there. I mean, I get up and go and I can talk to them. You know, I can listen. Sometimes you just need to listen. Right. So it taught me all of this that I could, that I could actually be strong enough to get up out of bed and go embrace someone else's child mm -hmm. uh, who needed that embrace or who just needed to listen to some, you know, someone to listen to them or talk to somebody who wasn't mama or daddy, <laughs> you know. Right. Uh, uh, so though, that's kind of what I think I would say it has taught me. And being resilient that we could come back and uh, start this, this nonprofit. Mm -hmm. uh, it was about, it did take me five years, but we got it done, you know. So we've been up and going. Uh, we started right before the pandemic. Uh, I think our board met twice and then we have been uh, in pandemic mode. So everything's virtual. So, but it's, 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 it, we've got a good start and, and we're going to make a difference in Pine Bluff and South Arkansas. So um, it is rewarding uh, because I know we're helping people. And even like you giving me the opportunity, just reaching out to say, come share your story. Now, I didn't share my story about my mental illness until a year and a half ago. It was the first time I ever publicly acknowledged right. that I had, that I suffer with mental illness. I live with it daily, you know, but no one would know if I didn't tell you. And so I tell people to say, you know, with treatment, with, you know, with the proper treatment, with the proper medication, you know, you, you can too, you know, uh, I've had times I wanted to give up. Absolutely. I've, I've been through that. I've had times I didn't want to be here. You know, uh, there are times I wake up and it's almost like I just got the news that my son had passed. Mm 
Right. You know, there are other times I wake up laughing because I'm thinking about something he did or said, you know. And um, so, yeah, I go through a range of emotions. I still go through a range of emotions. You said you, um, I want to pick up on two things that you uh, talked about. Number one, um, how has it made you feel um, getting your own personal story out? That's number one. And then number two, um, you said sometimes you wake up thinking about, you know, a funny story of him, about him. Um, yeah. Number two, can you share one or two uh, special memories that you have of him? Yeah, yeah, something? I will. Um, let, let me answer the first question first. Uh, you know, it's funny that you asked me that. You're the uh, only the third person, I mean, the second person to interview me that I've shared my story with. I shared my story um, at the facility where I get treatment during Mental Health Awareness Month, which is May. Right. So May, I guess, two years ago. And then the first time I shared it publicly, uh, I was on a radio station, a local radio station here in Pine Bluff. And then today you, you, you know, you're, I'm sharing here, here. but it, when I first shared my story, about my own illness, mm -hmm. it was like a burden was lifted. It was almost like I was keeping a secret, mm -hmm. although it's my business. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's my life. Yeah, right, right. Uh, but at the same time, uh, I've worked for uh, public figures, elected officials. Um, I've worked for numerous elected officials. And and I'm very kind of open and transparent. You know, I don't have, um, you know, I mean, I, I don't have like skeletons or, I, you know, I don't live that kind of life where there's stuff I'm hiding, <laughs> you know. Um, but, uh, and, 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 I'm, and, I'm a, and I'm public, you know, I'm very active. I'm all over social media. I have causes and, 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 and people know what I stand for. But at the same time, it was very liberating mm. to share my personal story of my challenge mm -hmm. with mental living with a mental illness. And I, I had no idea that that was going to be the impact. I just knew at some point that I had to share what I was living with mm -hmm. in order to do the work as openly as, and transparently as I can in memory of my son. Right. So it's like, how do you do the work and you not share your own struggle? Mm -hmm. And and so when I first shared it, it was just like a relief. It's yeah. like, yes, I did it. I shared my story. Right, right. And um and so then it was it it just kind of like I said, it was liberating. It was very empowering. And it's like, I feel like I have control. I don't have to hide it. And not that I was hiding it. You just don't go tell people every day. Right. You know, it is not the topic of conversation, <laughs> you know. Right. And then people, uh, you know, of course, my inner circle knew now. They knew. My family, close family and inner circle knew. But other people would say, well, we had no idea. Well, no, you don't, because if, if I'm in a dark place, I'm not in the public, you know, I'm not, you know, and I don't come out and talk about it, you know, it's just, I live my life, you know, um, so it has been very liberating for me to do that and to be able to talk about my son's illness and, uh, and that led to his death and empowered me to want to live more and do more and accomplish more to help other people. It's not even about me. You know, it's about helping other people share my story. You be encouraged and empowered that, hey, if she can do this, I mean, I still have my career. I, I live my life, but I do take medication every day. You know, I still see a therapist. I still see a psychiatrist. You know, um, I have coping mechanisms um, and, and, and I have a support system and I've learned what to do. And I've learned to take my medication as prescribed and not get off of it. Right, right. <laughs> you know, I mean, I've learned those things, you know, uh, some hard lessons, but I've learned, I've learned. So, but about my son, you ask about some, uh, he, he, was, he was such a kind heart. Uh, th there's a lot of great stories, <laughs> um, uh, but the one I'll share, his, his dad and I, 
like I said, was going through a divorce and uh, it was during the holidays this particular year and all three of my kids were in high school. No, 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 I'm sorry. My youngest one was at uh, Jack Roby, okay? And so they all had plans. This, it was, I don't know, it was during the school break. They all had plans to go out. And it was, it was after Christmas leading up to New Year's. So they always have a big New Year's bash uh, with their friends. And so, but this particular evening, I was just thankful that they all had somewhere to go. They were happy. And I was going to stay home and chill in my recliner in my bedroom. And when DeAndre realized, I mean, he came downstairs and, you know, he was all clean and ready to go. And his, his sister had already left because she had a car. She had left with her friends. My youngest son uh, had been picked up by a parent of, of a friend. They weren't going to hang out. And he was getting ready. He did not want to leave his mama in the house by herself during Christmas. And he just sat there. I was in my recliner and he, he says, I'm not, mom, I'm not going to leave you. And I said, baby, I'm fine. I'm fine. Right. And, and, and so finally, I mean, he just laid his head on my lap and he didn't want to go. He had friends that were like coming. He had a vehicle too. And it was the sweetest moment. And so after about 10 minutes, I said, let me walk you to your truck, you know, so it, so he could be okay, right. you know, that mama was okay at home, chilling by herself, <laughs> and I really was, and so the, it, it had been about 20 minutes, so the only way he would leave is that I walked my son to the truck, and he gave me the biggest bear hug. I mean, he's a football player and he's strong. He don't know his own strength, but he gave me the biggest hug. And he says, mama, he called me ma. He yeah. said, ma, I love you. I said, I love you too, sweetheart. Mm -hmm. He said, you sure you're going to be okay? I said, I'm good. I said, I got my beverage, <laughs> my refreshments. <laughs> Your refreshments. And yeah, and I'm gonna watch TV and I was okay. But just the compassion he had in his heart, he didn't just run out and hang with his friends when he realized, you know, I was there alone. And he, cause he was like, you're not gonna get with your girlfriends. I says, no, I just want to just chill, you know, but it was just that though it was moments like that, that I just treasure. Mm -hmm. I just treasure that. So that was just the kind of kid he was. And he was going to cancel his plans to hang out. I said, oh, no, 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 no. You go, you're going to go. And that, that's just the kind of kid he was. Yeah. yeah. So but it, a lot of good memories. A lot of good memories. Yeah. <laughs> Miss Seals, thank uh -huh. you so much for sharing your story, your personal story, and sharing your son's story. Uh, we appreciate it. I know yeah. that there's someone out there who's going to see this and yeah. benefit from it. So thank you so much for sharing that. Well, thank you, uh, Kenya, for having me. And, um, you know, I'm honored that you uh, reached out to, for me to do this. And, and I, I, I want to do these. Uh, you know, I'm ready to start talking about my journey and my son's journey uh, with the hopes of helping other people, because there's a lot of people suffering. Uh, you know, the, the suicidal rates are increasing uh, in the African-American community. We're losing a lot of our young black boys by suicide. Yes. And we need to talk about it. We need to have these conversations in our homes, at our dinner tables, you know, uh, in our churches, mm -hmm. uh, in our synagogues and places. We've got to have these conversations. So Thank you for having me. And I will say we do have a Facebook page. Yes. Uh, if people want to go, it's the DeAndre Seals Suicide Prevention Outreach Project. And um, we are coming with the website really soon. And once we do the website, we're going to have a really big release, uh, vir virtual release, of course, right. um, offer resources. And we, we've got a great board that works with us. And so... Uh, you know, we're, we're, like I said, it's bittersweet. It really is. It's bittersweet, but it's good to be able to share the story um, of my son and, and just to try to help the next person and the next family. So thank you for having me. Thank you so much for sharing. And with that, that's going to be a wrap. Thank you. Bye.